and it says, it says that it's recording. I love it when technology works. Hello, everybody. This is Janet Roper. I'm animal communicator and educator, and I welcome you to the wonderful world of animal communication. We are a small group tonight, at least thus far. So if you have any questions, um, I invite you to ask them. I'm not muting anybody at this point. Um, so if you have any questions, I just invite you to ask them as they pop into your mind. Because I know sometimes when we are talking about something like animal communication, which frankly with animal communication, it's that way except when it's not. And there's a lot of it's not in animal communication. So if there's any questions that pop up that you want to ask as we are talking, just make sure that you pop in and ask those questions. And um, we also have here, well, not yet, but I have a feeling he'll be here later tonight. Um, my angel horse, Shiloh, he, oh, he's here. He said he was here. <laughs> he said that he was sorry for coming in late, but you know, sometimes horses are just late and that's all you can do about it. Shiloh is my angel horse. Um, we were together for 18 years, I believe. And when I moved to Montana, his way of staying in Minnesota was for me not to find a way to get him out here, no transport. And then he decided to stay in Minnesota and he passed away there. So that was, as weird as it sounds, that was his way of being with me because of his age, because of his medical condition. Um, he would not have made the trip well coming out here, crossing over the, the mountains and everything and going through the passes and the winters here. And, um, and he knew that the best way for him to be with me was to pass away in Minnesota so he could be an angel horse. So he's an angel horse and he's here. And he wants to tell people that are on the call tonight, he says, I'm here and you can listen to me. Janet talks a lot, but I will stop and I will interrupt her, interrupt her when I feel there is something that is important to be said. She doesn't always cover all of the spots that she needs to because she can't help it. She's a human. She just thinks like that. But I'm an animal. I think like an animal and I know animals. So I will interrupt Janet as needed. That is for Mr. Shiloh. And a little bit about myself. I have communicated with animals my entire life. Um, I was not, it was not acceptable when I was growing up. I was an only child to older parents and, you know, they wanted everything just so, oh my God, they had me dressed in roughly dresses and you know I'm not a roughly dressed kind of gal. Um, but anyway, they just wanted everything to be so-so. And so when I say, hey, the, the squirrel's talking, um, you know, it's like, don't tell the neighbors. What will the neighbors think? So um, I was not encouraged, as most of us who fall into animal communication, I was not encouraged as a child to use my intuition or to um, admit that there is an intuition that we all have an intuitive sense. So while I say I've practiced animal, I've been an animal communicator all of my entire life. It was just in about, I wanna say 2003, 2005, something like that, that I started doing it professionally. And since then the world has turned around and it has just been a wonderful place. It's really magnificent to see the world through the animal's eyes and to experience the world as they experience it. So that when I get that information from the animal, how they're experiencing the world, I can bring that back to the quote unquote, you know, our real world, so to speak, and share it with their humans. And that really helps to make a, a win-win for everybody. In my animal communication practice, um, my focus is helping people build relationship with animals. It's helping working with grief, um, processing the grief, pet grief um, that we all experience. And um, I've also in the past year, actually past probably 14 months, uh, I've started walking the shamanic path, which means that I'm doing an intensive shamanic study. And at the end of my second year, which will be in December, um, I will be doing, adding some shamanic practice to my animal communication practice. I don't know what it looks like yet, but I do have a feeling that it's going to enable um, all of us to be more deeply connected with the animals. So I am cheerfully owned and operated by one cat and one dog, and they do own and operate me, particularly Raven the cat. Tonight, you are in the right place. And I know every, you wouldn't be here if you weren't in the right place. That just makes so much sense, Janet. But you're here because you have a deep love and a respect for animals. 
you have a feeling that the animals are trying to connect with you, but you're not sure how to jump in on the conversation, so to speak. You can hear what they're saying. You know there's something there. You look into your dog's eyes and you're going, hmm, I know he's trying to tell me something, but I have no idea what it is. And you're also in the right place tonight if you've always wanted to communicate with animals, but you weren't sure of what the first step was. We'll be covering that tonight. And that's going to give you a lot of mileage um, to help you connect with the animals. So I encourage you to take notes tonight. Um, and those notes can either be, oh, we have somebody who joined us. Hello there. Welcome. Um, I encourage you to take notes tonight. Um, those notes can either be written notes, which you can email to me later, and we'll talk about this later, or they can be um, uh, pictures, screenshots, if you want to do that. Then there is a reason for me asking for that. So what we're going to talk about tonight, and again, because we are small in number, I invite you to um, ask your questions as they come up. Nobody is muted at this point. Um, so just pop in there with those questions. What we're going to cover tonight is how I got my start as an animal communicator, what I love about animal communication, and why I find it so helpful. I'm going to tell you the question that I am most asked, and I was going to say I should leave you hanging and not give you the answer, but I will give you the answer too. And um, we'll talk what animal communication is, what it is not, how it works and how you can get started. And like I said, I'm going to give you some tips tonight to help you get started um, on your animal communication journey. And then ways that we can um, stay together, stay connected after this call. So how I got my start in animal communication as a communicator was um, one of my dogs passed away, Squirty passed away. And at that time I was a, a two dog kind of person. And so I know I needed another dog in my life. And at that time I had three cats, one dog. I was teaching music in my house, which meant that I had probably 40 plus students and their parents and their siblings coming in from week to week. So I needed a dog that was really gentle, friendly, and would be able to thrive in the a living situation that I offered. So I went to, I was living in Minnesota at the time, so I went to what was then called the Wright County Humane Society. And I walked in, and it was a little country humane society, and there was this, he was a small dog, he was filthy dirty, he was just as fat as, I don't know what, as Santa Claus, and he had the biggest smile on his face and he had this little dog that was attached to his tail and the bigger dog was pulling the little dog around, you know, and they were just having this great time. And I was not into intuition at the time. And so I had gone with my list of questions. Okay, this is what I need. Please help me find the dog that I need. I didn't even think dream at that time about using intuition, but I walked in and for whatever reason, I knew that was my dog, and his name was Tundra. And so I, I pulled out my questions, and I, here's my list, and how does he do with this? How is he with kids? How is he with strangers coming in the house? What is he like? What is he just like? Does he keep his kennel clean? And they said, yes, he keeps his kennel clean. So um, I adopted Tundra, who turned out, I renamed him Teddy. And um, I got him home, and he kept the kennel clean, but he didn't keep the rest of the house clean. And that was a problem. I know, I know. <laughs> and there's just a part of me that was going, oh, you know, he's eight years old. Maybe there's a medical problem. So we went to the vet. They gave him a thorough checkout. He was perfectly healthy. We worked with a trainer who was not the trainer for us. And perhaps I should have looked for another trainer, but it didn't work out that way. And so literally I'm sitting in front of the fireplace one day in Minnesota in the cold and I'm lighting up the fire and this ad for animal communicator falls into my lap. And I'm going, well, what the heck? I've tried everything else. I have nothing to lose because the training or the trainer that I was working with, that didn't work. The vet said everything is fine. I might as well try animal communicator. So I did. She was in the neighborhood. She came by and I started watching how she worked with Teddy. And um, I'm going, I've done that all my life. And I didn't know it had a name. And it just kind of like struck me in the head, literally like a two by four. So I watched her work with Teddy. I watched the results. And um, to make a long story short, 
Teddy, literally almost until his dying day, he kept the house clean. And what I, when I would go, his job was to keep the house clean. Because as I explained to him, you know, we're, I'm working with Teddy through animal communication. Like I would be working with any of you folks. Okay. The only difference would be he has a tail. He had a tail and you guys don't. Okay. So I'm working with him. It's your job to keep the house clean, Teddy. I can clean up after you, but you need to keep the house clean. And so I go do my errands and he would come back. And it was like, oh. I get the house clean and I could tell by his body language and he would sh prance around and he'd show me all the places where he kept the house clean. And when he didn't keep the house clean, his, his body language would just kind of hang down, you know? And I was like, it's okay, buddy. You try to keep the house clean. I'll clean up. And it was literally pretty much until his dying day uh, when his little body gave out in the bedroom. I mean, literally collapsed um, that he kept the house as clean as he could. So that was my start into animal communication. And uh, most people who work, who work with animal communication, whether they're professionals or lay people doing it just for the heck of it, whatever, a lot of them are, are brought in by their animals, which, you know, it makes sense. The animals are calling us to really, they're calling on us humans to really be on our toes, step up to the line and do what we are meant to do. And stop just saying, oh, I can't communicate with animals. Oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. No, they're, they're calling us. They're saying, hey, it's time to get on the bandwagon and join us. So the things that I love about animal communication is um, how it deepens the bond between people and their animals. And I just love it when I'm working with a human client. And I also love that I have a job where I have to identify which species I'm working with. Mm -hmm. So when I'm working with my human clients, I love it when I see the light bulb go off over their head and they say, mm -hmm. I didn't know I could do that. Do you know the difference that it made? And yeah. And I just love seeing that. It's so cool. And of course, you know, the, the animal that they've called about, they're just going, well, yeah, hello. You know, we've been trying to tell you this. And now you're listening to us. Yay. The mm -hmm. animals really like that. Mm -hmm. I delight in witnessing when the person realizes that, yes, they can connect with the animals. It's not just wishful thinking anymore. It never was wishful thinking. Um, it's not just, oh, I hope I can. Oh, I really wish I could. You know, maybe I need to talk to an animal communicator, an outside authority, it's like, mm, nope, you don't need to. You just need to learn how to tune in to your own animals. And we do that so many ways, in so many different ways every day, that um, once you become aware, consciously aware, of how you're tuned into your own animals, that really helps to open up the door to animal communication. I also love it when people realize that we can connect with all animals. So in animal communication, uh, those things that drive me crazy, like time and space, <laughs> you know, like I'm always, I'm always losing track of the dates and of the time and, um, you know, reading a map to me, it, it just doesn't work. Um, those things don't exist in animal communication. There's no such thing as time and space, which is why I can talk to a dog that's on the other side of the world why you can talk to a dog that's on the other side of the world or that's at the other end of your neighborhood or why we can all talk to angel animals or why we can talk to what some people refer to as mythological animals. Um, yeah, they appeared in myth, but you know, they're in life too, but that's a different mm -hmm. subject. Mm -hmm. And I also love when people realize when they get to see that their animal, it's more than just a dog. It's more than just a cat. It's more than just a bird. But their animal is, can actually be a guide for them and help them um, do things that they didn't think they could do, whether that is um, doing some kind of healing, releasing some blocks that maybe the person has been carrying. Maybe it's um, an animal that's been helping you with a project that you've wanted to get going or something like that. But when the people realize that the animals, it's not just one way on the leash, it's two way. And when we start to open up to have that two way conversation going on the leash, life is just really grand. So let me ask you this, uh, people on the call. Um, I don't, yeah, you're not muted unless you've muted yourself. Um, what has been your experience with animal communication in your own life? Jennifer, you want to jump in? Uh, yes, it's been pretty amazing. Um, 
and and you were a big part of it, Janet, as you may recall. Um, for us, we were having some issues with uh, our one of our dogs. We mm-hmm. lost his companion dog, and I, I call her that because there's no other way to put it. Really, they they were together for ten years in one day, and they they were heart dogs. Um, anyway, he was he was being finicky about food. We were really concerned that in his grief that we were going to end up losing him as well. Mm-hmm. And we reached out to you. And I will never forget, you said to us, he keeps showing me dig water. And we said, and we said digging and water, and you, you mm-hmm. clarified that and said, yes, digging and water. I'll let you know if I can work this out. And, and, and you told us, and you guys think about it, see if we can work now figure out what he's trying to tell us. And about three days later, I did not have this off my mind. I just kept thinking, digging in water, digging in water. And about three days later, I'm sitting down at the breakfast table having a cup of coffee and this still weighing on my mind, digging in water, digging in water. And all of a sudden, the light bulb went off right above my head. I just, it's like you could just sense it. And I went, his swimming pool. And we live here in Minnesota. It was getting colder out. It was past the time where we would have had his little kitty pool out any longer. We put that swimming pool out for one day only, filled it up with water. He jumped into that pool. And all he did was dig and dig and dig and splash <laughs> water out of that pool for, oh my goodness, it must have been about 10 minutes. And when he finished, it was like that was his physical way of needing to just push that grief out. And he just lifted his head when he was done and looked at us like, thank you. I mean, he just had this look on his face like he was had found some kind of peace in that moment. And he just looked at us like, thank you so much for listening. And I'll never forget it. And he walked out of that kiddie pool. And that was that. He, he was, and, and, you know, he's never wanted to go back into a kiddie pool again. That's fascinating. That is, and I remember you sending me the picture of that, or was it a video? It must have been a video because I could actually see the digging going on. Yeah. 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 Thank you for sharing that, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, Jan, would you like to share how, if you use experience, if you use animal communication in your life, how you do that? Hello. Are you muted? Not muted from this end. Can you check and see if you're muted? Okay. Well, let's just go on. And like I say, um, nobody is muted right now. So if you have something to say, just feel free to pop right on in. So benefits to animal communication. We've already been talking about them. Um, but one of them is you get it directly from the animal's point of view what's going on. I don't have to ask somebody else. I don't have to Google it. I don't have to rack my brain um, to try different things to see what's going on. If Max, my dog Max, isn't eating, I don't have to like go through 59 million different things. I can just say, Max, what do you need? And then he will send me, usually with Max, he sends pictures. He'll send me pictures or words or something, or I'll get a word like chicken. I need more chicken. I need more protein. So benefit number one for me is that you get to hear directly from the animal what's happening in their world. Benefit number two for me is that you can learn about potential um, diseases before they become serious. So it's kind of like doing um, a check-in, you know, you take your, your animals into the vet for the checkups, you know, it's kind of like doing an animal communication checkup. Um, Because sometimes with the animals, something will be going on that um, even the vets might not be able to notice or to see or something because it's in such an early stage. But if the cat is telling me, oh, you know, I really feel like this, I feel this burning sensation, then I can give that to the human. And, and then the human, can, if they desire, if they want to, they can take that information to the vet. And we'll talk later about how animal communication is not a substitute for medical care or for training. But one of the things that I do love about it, one of the benefits I see, is that hearing from the animal how they are feeling, so you can pass that information on. You can also find out what's going on with the animal that, you know, you might see a discipline problem that's going on, what might be termed as a discipline problem. 
in most cases, in my experience, and I'm not a trainer, okay, so I don't venture into that world of where um, people, trainers see, you know, discipline problems every day at, as an ordinary way of being. In my world as a communicator, when I see a discipline problem, or when the person tells me there's a discipline problem, my first instinct, and this is through years and years and years and years of being trained by the animals, is what's going on with that animal? And usually it's something medical that's going on. I was working with a horse um, a couple of weeks ago, and um, he is um, he's, uh, an award winner reigning horse. He does the circuit there in central, uh, in, in the central part of the United States. I don't know if he's done the whole United States, but you know, he's on a big circuit there. And um, the trainer was having a really heck of a hard time working with him. And she was saying, he'll, he'll like go to a certain point and then it's like he loses it. It's like his brain disconnects. So I'm talking wow. to the horse and what I was getting was, yeah, his brain was disconnecting. He had had, and I forget what, what disease it was, but he had a disease of some sort that he had been treating him for, for approximately eight months. And his physical body was so much better, but the neurons or whatever you call it in the brain, the, the connectors, the fire upper thingies, um, they weren't connecting properly. So I could, the horse told me that, and he pretty much said it in those words, probably because if he'd said anything more medical than that, I wouldn't have gotten it. Um, the horse told me that I was able to tell the trainer and the owner that. And then... Um, they've got him on different, they, they've taken off training for a while. They've taken him off the um, reigning circuit for a while. And they're doing um, kinesiology with him. They've changed his food. Um, they've changed his, um, had a dental with him. And part of what was happening, he was in pain around his face because of dental problems. And when I was telling um, the owner that, she said, but he just had a dental like three months ago. And I'm going, he's feeling pain. And he was because... Um, usually when a dental is done on a horse, um, a vet does it, and they're not, tech, they're trained, but they don't have the extensive training uh, that an equine dentist does. So they had an equine dentist come in and, you know, um, the, the um, floating had been done incorrectly. So um, animal communication helps to solve discipline problems or see what's at the root of them. Um, one of the hard things... I think it's a benefit. I think it's a big benefit. It's one of the reasons that I love animal communication is working with people and with their animals in the death and dying and in the hospice scenario. And that is such a tender time and it is such a difficult time. And there's so many different emotions going on, but it's, I think, a help to see what the animal wishes in their own um, journey to the other side. Like my horse Shiloh, he, when I saw him in August of 2015, he said I knew at the time that that would be the last time I saw him. I couldn't accept it, so he didn't do anything to, you know, tell me about it or, you know, really um, make me wake up to that fact or anything. He just said I knew it at the time, and in hindsight, I did know it at the time, and I couldn't accept it. Because when I saw Shiloh for the last time, he didn't look like Shiloh. And I just wrote it off to... Well, you know, I've been under a lot of stress. I've had to move. I've, had, I've been kicked out of my house, basically. I've got to go to a different state, and then I, I can only stay there for so long, then I've got to go to a different state. So there's a lot of stress going on. Um, and I assumed that the reason that Shiloh didn't look like himself was because I was under that stress, but he didn't look like himself because he was getting ready to pass. So that, to me, is one of the biggest benefits, is helping the animal and helping the, um, helping the, animal and helping the person come to terms with um, what's going on. We have a note here. Let me just check real quick. I really love Zoom. You are very welcome. And if you would like to type questions into the chat box, I've got it open now. So, you know, I'm happy to answer questions that I come into the chat box too. But most of all, the, the reason I love animal communication is we are meeting the animals in a way that is native to them to speak. And that is taking us off of our human pedestal, so to speak, and putting us more on an equal, equal footing. So, um, and, and it's, like I said, you know, using our intuition, that is native to us too, but we've forgotten how to do it. 
um, and we've ignored it and it's atrophied. So the animals are helping us to walk back into the world of animal communication. So um, I want to remind folks to take notes, whether that's written notes or whether that's screenshots, whatever works for you, because at the end, um, I'll explain why. I always love this. I feel like it's a little treasure trove or something. My most asked question, and I bet you're going to believe this one, is can anybody talk? Can I talk to the animals? Can anybody talk to the animals? And it's like, yeah, you can. All of us have the ability to talk to the animals. We all don't have the desire to talk to the animals, but we all have the ability. Um, and just knowing that, I think that frees people up when it comes to learning animal communication. So I think when people meet me for the first time, they expect that I am like this gypsy guru kind of person with the crystal ball. And, you know, they're kind of, I think they expect to see like ghosts following me or something, or that we're meeting in a graveyard or something, you know, because a lot of people, that's how they, especially first timers, and it's not so much now as when I first started, um, how people experience animal communication. It's really out there on the woo-woo branch and everything. Um, but it is a very normal way of life and a very normal way to experience life. So let's talk about what animal communication is not to begin with, okay? And people always laugh when I say this, but animal communication is not magic. You are not gonna call me and, um, or any other communicator that I'm aware of and have a half hour telephone call and then boom, abracadabra, everything is well, everything is fixed. It's not gonna happen. And the reason for that is because just like us when we are changing our behavior, it's the same thing with animals. When we are asking them to change their behavior, it takes time. But even more than that, when one of us, whether it's the human or the animal, is changing the behavior, there's behavior changes that need to go on in the whole realm of the household with everybody, regardless of species. So um, it's not magic. There's homework to be done. When I was working with my dog, Teddy, the animal communicator gave me the homework of cleaning the house. And I'm thinking, I did clean the house. She goes, no, go get a black light and look for the urine stains. I'm going, oh, geez, this is embarrassing, you know? So yeah, that motivated me to really clean the house and everything. Um, do dogs talk via the English language or just any other human language? Good question. The way we humans take things in usually through verbal communication because that's what we do. The animals can send us information through any of our senses, which means they can send us words, which means they can send us pictures, they can send us colors, they can send us physical feelings, they can send us emotional feelings. So the words are not dependent on what language there is, um, but it's dependent on the feelings behind that language. So if regardless of the language, if you're telling your dog, I love you, they're going to get that regardless of the language, because it's the emotions that are behind that. So animal communication is not magic. Um, it's not a medical diagnosis or a prescription. And um, sometimes people will ask me, you know, I, I, I probably should take my animal to the vet, but you know, you're cheaper than the vet. It's like, yeah, well, I can't help you. You know, um, that, that's not my cup of tea. That's not what I do. Ethically, I wouldn't do it um, because I'm not trained in doing that. And um, sometimes it's hard for people to understand that. But what I can do is, like I said earlier, understand what the animal is telling me. I feel this, like the horse was telling me, I feel all discombobulated in my brain kind of thing. And then relay that to the owner, to the um, to the vet, to the professional, whatever, and let them come up with a technical um, care program that needs to, be, to uh, be implemented to take care of that. Animal communication is not a replacement for training. Um, and it's, it's also not, um, how can I say this? 
it, I'll use my dog, Max, for an example. Max loves to bark. Okay, he's got this big bark window here that runs against one side of the wall and he can see, oh, for miles and he just, he barks at everything that goes by. And, um, you know, I can tell him to stop barking, but it doesn't work because I'm not training him to stop the barking. So when I take the steps to train him to not bark, that's when it works. And then using the animal communication as a supplement to that. So animal communication can be used as a supplement for medical issues and for training issues, but not as a replacement for either of those. Animal communication is a very innate way of talking to the animals. Um, and the thing that I love about it, you guys are going to get tired of hearing me say that, I'm sure. But what I really love about it is that if you think of it as a bridge, okay, humans are over here, animals are over here. The animals are already halfway across the bridge. They're already talking to us. So you don't have to believe in animal communication. You don't have to think or not that you can do it or not do it, okay? All you have to do is listen to your animal, and the communication starts so many times that way. Not about what do I think my dog is saying, what do I think my cat is saying, but you just quiet yourself and you listen to them. And since they're already over there halfway across the bridge, um, they're doing everything they can to help us. And, um, and it's through this two-way conversation, regardless of who instigates it. Uh, usually it's the animals that instigate it, especially at the beginning, because we humans have so many things that are just in our brain that we're going, can we do this? Can we not do this? That kind of thing. Monkey mind, I call it. Um, but usually it's the animals that instigate it. And then when we first start experiencing it and we first start realizing that, yes, this can happen, that's when the win-win um, happens for everybody. And so what's involved with actually doing animal communication is to do it, and this might sound so silly, to do it consciously and to do it purposefully, to purposefully connect with the animal. So not just in passing, you know, it's like, oh, oh, Max, would you, you know, as I'm walking past the window and he's barking, oh, Max, would you not bark kind of thing. But for me to take the time to purposely change my brain ways, to purposely um, go into a more meditative state so that I'm more on the relationship of where he is. Um, and, and connect with him that way. So just say, Max, stop barking kind of thing. Information is both sent and received through our senses, can also be sent and received through dreams, can also, um, can also, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh, it can also come through music. So if you're listening to the radio and, you know, all of a sudden this song comes up and there's a word in there that reminds you, oh, I need to help my, my dog with this or I need to help my cat with that. That's a form of communication. Um, correct. Animal communication is not a replacement for training. It's a supplement. Find out from the animal what's going on from their perspective. Okay. And then tell that to the trainer. And I'm experiencing that more trainers and more medical professionals, animal professionals are open to hearing about animal communication. Not all of them, mm -hmm. okay? So, you know, use your own intuition, your own gut feelings when you're sharing that information. Um, with one of the vets that I worked with when I was in Minnesota, you know, they just thought I was wiki-wacky for doing animal communication. Um, so I, after the first couple of times I went and said that, you know, and I, they kind of, um, politely rolled their eyes. It was just like, okay, I need to figure out a different way to say this. So from there on out, I was, it was like, you know, I've watched Max walk and it's like, he's got a hitch in his giddy up. Um, can you check the left hip and see what's going on? Are you seeing anything different there? Or is it just me imagining things? So there's ways that you can phrase it. So um, you don't have to use the word animal communicator, animal communication, or intuition. And I want to really affirm that the boundaries of time and space do not exist in animal communication. So um, sometimes you'll receive something from an animal. Prime example with my horse Shiloh. Um, when I was riding him regularly, <coughs> excuse me, or as regularly as I did because I'm, I'm a horrible rider. I got a horse because I wanted to learn to ride and that's not what came out of it, but that's beside the point. Um, but when I was going out to the barn and riding him and seeing him regularly, um, I, I was home one night and I would be home by 7.30, 8 o'clock from the barn. 
and then, you know, go doing whatever I needed to do to get ready for bed, get ready for the next day. And I remember Shiloh telling me one night, I love that you're the last thing I see at night, that I'm the last thing you see at night, and you always tell me good night, buddy. And I'm going, what the heck? What the heck? This horse has just gone off the deep end. What's he talking about? So I asked him, and you know, Shiloh, in his wisdom, because he is a wise horse, said, I love that I'm the last thing you see at night. And you always say, good night, buddy. I'll see you tomorrow. So me being a little bit slow on the uptake, it probably took me six weeks to figure out he was the last thing I saw at night because um, I'm also a geek. So I had my computer, my laptop in bed with me doing my laptop stuff. And he was the picture on the screen on my um, laptop. And I would turn it off and it was always, good night, buddy. I'll see you tomorrow. He was the last thing I saw. So information in animal communication, it, to me, it like drips in as you need it to, okay? I think if we got it all in a rush, if we got the big picture all at once, like we all want to, it might be too much because there are changes that usually need to be made. So there's that timing element that's involved with communication, that it comes to us when we most need it. Um, let's go ahead and let's talk about what I call the circle of quiet, okay? And what that is, is for people who are beginning animal communication to learn how to quiet themselves. Um, to learn how to quiet themselves so that they can connect with the animals and to be, and here comes my cat, Raven. He, he usually comes up about this point. Come on, Rave. You're not going to come? You're going to say hello? No? Okay. Um, that we're going to start with quieting our mind, quieting our body, and then getting into a really meditative state. And before we do that, we've got a question in the chat room. Right, so my dog, too, he began to look at me happily in thoughts. Come, like he is telling me he's happy that I leave him at home. Is that a form of animal communication? Or I'm using my intuition? Yes. Yes, that is a form of animal communication. Also, particularly at the beginning, um, I think a great supportive tool for animal communication in affirming what you did or did not get is the body language of the animal. So if you have that animal, you're, if you're practicing with your own animals and you have them in front of you and you can see what their body language is, that is like saying, yeah, you got it. You got it. Or no, you didn't get it. Or, you know, or for instance, if you've got a cat and you ask the cat if, um, and I'm talking a real life, you know, in the same room with you kind of cat, um, and you ask the cat if you can talk to her and you get the feeling she says no and you go, I'm going to do it anyway because, you know, I can't trust what I'm getting. Ah, it's just in my imagination. She wouldn't say that to me. And so you start talking to the cat and she leaves the room. Okay, that's body, that's body language that is confirming what you already got. Or what, what cats I think are notorious at doing is that um, if you ask if you can pet them, and they, you hear no, but you, again, you think it's your imagination or whatever, and you start to pet them, and then they move this so you're just right out of your reach. You can't, oh, that's funny. <laughs> Raven went under my hand. <laughs> he wanted to be petted. Um, you know, they're just far enough that you would have to move to actually pet them. And then they just move that quarter of an inch away that you still can't reach them. So when you, especially when you're doing at the beginning of animal communication, okay, um, and the animal is with you, look for the body language as a way to hone in, um, to reflect if you've got the answers or not. So um, if you guys, if you ladies, excuse me, have a way to quiet yourself, um, as you start your, your circle of quiet, by all means do that. What I'm going to walk you through is a quieting mechanism that I use. And I sit comfortably, feet flat on the floor, and I'm open across the chest, and my hands are up, they're open. And then to the count of three, I will inhale from the left side, picturing the energy from the earth in my left foot coming up, going through my body, inhale to the count of three. I will hold that here to the count of three. I will exhale on the right to the count of three. And as I exhale, I'm exhaling the toxins um, that are accumulated in, in, in my body, in all of our bodies. So it's inhale, 
from the left to the count of one, two, three, hold, two, three, exhale, two, three, and one more round. Inhale on the left, two, three, hold, two, three, exhale on the right, two, three. So that is a way to quiet yourself. And as you are quieting yourself, another thing to remember is to go to a place where you won't be disturbed, a place where you can shut the door, a place where you can leave the everyday time, everyday concerns away for the minutes that you are with the animals. So no cell phones, no TV, no white noise, but you want to be in a place of quiet. And in that place of quiet, you can again practice the breathing. Or if it quiets you to actively listening for any sounds that you might hear. Maybe if you're in a bedroom and the windows are open, you hear the birds chirping, you hear the traffic going by. That is another way to quiet. So you're in a physical quiet place where you won't be disturbed. In that physical quiet place, you quiet your body, continuing with the breathing. And one of the things that I love to do is just to relax in the chair and let it support me. It's like, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to do anything. If I were to do something, um, that chair would still have a hold of me. I don't even have to consciously set up. The chair is supporting me. And then as your body is quieting, your mind will also start to quiet. And this is actually where you are changing brain waves. And you're going to a deeper brain wave away from the monkey mind that we have in our everyday life. You're going to that place of peace and quiet. Some people have experienced it as that place between waking up, falling asleep, where you're just in that place of, am I awake, am I asleep kind of thing, so that your brain waves have really quieted down. And then once you are quiet, ask permission to speak with the animal. And if this is an animal that you already have in mind, perhaps it's your own dog, ask their permission, okay? In animal communication, there's a lot with ethics, but basically, if you remember, please, may I, and thank you, you will get a lot from the animals. And you will, that will do a lot in their eyes to show you that, to show them that you are honoring them as another sentient being and not coming from a place of, I'm the human and you need to talk to me because I said so. So ask permission to speak to them. And then the animals can either say yes, no, or maybe, just like we would in a conversation. If they say no, honor that, okay? Uh, because just like us, not all animals feel like talking. You know, they might be busy, they might be tired, they might have other things on their mind. They may not want to talk to you at that time. So just to honor it. It's important not to take it personally. Because my belief is whatever comes through in animal communication, it is what needs to come through at that time. And so there's no judgments involved. It's just observing what's going on. If the animal says maybe, then you can say, well, okay, will you let me know when it's a yes? And then rely on them. Trust them to do it. They will. And if they say yes and give you the go ahead, then go ahead with your conversation. Ask them the questions that you have. But it's more than asking, it's listening to the questions. Listening to the way you're phrasing the questions so that you're asking open-ended questions. And that's Max, he's agreeing with us. Um, and then you're listening to their response. And the response will come through different ways. Like I said earlier, come through your senses. You can hear words, 
You're not making them up, okay? You can get, uh, some people smell, get, have a good sense of smell, and they will experience a smell from the animal that helps them in getting the answer that the animal wants to get across. Um, you can get physical feelings, you can get emotional feelings. Trust that the animal is going to send you the information in the way that it's the easiest for you. Because think of it this way, the animal's talking to you not only just because you want to talk to them, they want to talk to you too. So the fact that they want to talk to you means they're going to do whatever they can to make that conversation as easy for you as they can, particularly at the beginning. So just respond to the questions, you know, or the conversation like you would if you were talking with a human. And then again, at the end of the conversation, remember to thank the animal. Again, it's those please, may I, and thank you. If you remember that, you are like 90 million miles ahead of a lot of people. Please, may I, and thank you. And so what you've done by creating the circle of quiet, I mean, this is profound. This is really profound what you have done. And I know we went through it quickly. And I know that, you know, um, we didn't take time to communicate with the animals. But what you have done in, in just this little tip of the iceberg that we've experienced tonight, that you've experienced tonight, is you have stilled yourself. I wouldn't be surprised if you connected with an animal, and I wouldn't be surprised if you've got a conversation, perhaps not a fully formed conversation, but maybe a segment of a conversation that you can tune into later. So um, now that you know how to create your circle of quiet, I encourage you to do that consciously when connecting with the animals, okay? Because if you think of Lucy from, um, what was it, Peanuts? You know, the doctor is in, particularly at the beginning. We need this parameter of the animal communicator is in and listening. And it's, it's for us, okay? The animals don't need that. We need it so that we are out of our ordinary monkey mind time. We need that parameter. So set that parameter around as you are practicing um, talking with the animals in your life and see how that goes for you. So um, whenever you are, here's some things that you can do to, with your animal communication to start right now, a circle of quiet, okay? When you leave the house, give your animal a job to do. If you've got a dog with Max, what I do is, you guard, buddy, I'll be back. And his job is to guard the house. To Max, guarding the house means bark at any and every little thing that is in his concept out of the ordinary. And I like that. I, I mean, I don't like it at three o'clock in the morning, you know. <laughs> but, but still, at the same time, he's not going to bark at three o'clock in the morning unless he feels there's something I need to know about. So there's that, okay? But he's got a big bark. And um, so people, they're going to hear his bark. And if my car's not there, they're going to know that there's a big animal in the house. Okay, and he wouldn't do anything. I mean, he's just like the sweetest little puppy face on the face of the earth, but you know, you couldn't tell that from his bark kind of thing. So give your animal a job to do, and it's whatever they do naturally. If it's barking, you bark and you keep the boogeyman away, or you know, you, you do this, you do that. If it's a cat, watch the birds, okay? Um, a dog, it might be, well, actually with my cat, Raven, is that um, he is such a guardian cat. I swear, he is just, he runs the household. And now that I only, that there's only me and him and Max in the house, um, he's really taken that quite seriously, running the household, me in particular. <laughs> um, but what I will do with Raven is I will say, if I'm leaving, okay, you let me know if I need to come home for anything. And he does that. It's just amazing. When you return from your errands, ask them how it went. They'll tell you. And, you know, watch their body language. Like what I did with Teddy there at the beginning, watch the body language. That's really going to help you um, to discern what they're saying. And then keep a journal, okay? Don't do like what I did at the beginning, which meant, you know, whatever piece of mail came in, junk mail, I was writing notes on that. And then, of course, I threw out the junk mail because I didn't look on the back to see that that's where my notes were and yada, yada, yada. So keep a journal. And you can see what's going on in that journal and literally give yourself gold stars. 
You know, three weeks ago when I talked to Max, I'm just using him as an example, I was really having a hard time. I, I, it felt really difficult and I felt like I was going to cry because I wasn't getting anything. And three weeks later, it's not nearly as difficult. Stuff like that is what you note in your journal. Um, I also encourage you not to judge. Do not judge, please. Because anything that comes through in animal communication is what needs to come through. And I cannot stress that enough. If nothing comes through, okay, nothing comes through. And we humans, we think we're a failure because nothing comes through. But no, that's, that's like a great uh, fertile place of what can come through in that place of nothingness. Aha, Max agrees with me, okay? If you can't trust me, trust Max. Um, yeah, so trust whatever comes through. And I can't tell you enough to trust, trust, trust what you're getting. Even if it just sounds like you had bad chicken five minutes before you talk to the animal and, you know, it's just really crazy stuff, trust it. My experience has been, and this might sound um, silly, but my experience has been what I have quote unquote judged, and I know I shouldn't judge, but, you know, so I'm human, I do that sometimes, what I've judged to be crazy or like, how can I tell the people this? They're gonna think I'm nuts. That's what they needed to hear. That's that, that bond that they were looking for that they could not articulate, particularly when it comes to angel animals. So trust what you get. And one thing, and I still use this, is um, when I am thinking, oh my gosh, am I crazy? What's going on here? For me to trust what I get because out of everything that could come to me at that given moment in time, why did that piece of information come to me at that time from that animal in that way? So if you start getting, should I trust it? Or da -da 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 -da. Ask yourself that. Why did that come to me at that time, at that moment, from that animal in that way? And that takes us out of the judgment, and it helps us to get a bigger perspective of what's going on. So about the notes that I was um, asking you to take. The reason I did, yes, I'm a teacher. <laughs> so yes, I, it makes me happy to see people taking notes. <laughs> um, and also, you know, you'll have those to refer to. And yes, you will be getting both the call. Oh, I, Wait a minute, I forget how it's set up in Zoom. I, you'll be getting at least the audio of this, okay? Um, and I think you get the video too, so you'll be able to listen to it. And um, I forgot where I was going with that. Okay, so I'll tell you why um, I wanted you to take notes. The real reason is because um, after the call that you have 48 hours, so that would be, let's see, it's um, Tuesday, so that would be Thursday, um, midnight, uh, to send me, and this will be in the follow-up that I'm sending you, to send me question, a question about your animal. Send me their name, their birth date, if they're an angel animal or if they're still in the physical, and one question you have. And I will happily answer that question for you and get back to you. So what you also need to send me, besides the information about the animals, is send me a page of your notes. So... Between now and Thursday, and I'll be sending this to you um, to first thing tomorrow morning, send me a picture of your animal, their age, their name, and if they're an angel animal or if they're still with us, and one question that you have about them, and I will answer that for you. So I'm hoping that from tonight's call that you are realizing, are you realizing how much you're already doing animal communication and maybe just calling it a hunch? or a gut feeling, or, oh, it's just lucky. You know? Mm -hmm. When you start trusting that you're actually doing the communication, that's when those lights go off, and that's when it is just really wonderful. Mm -hmm. So my, my total belief is that anybody who loves, honors, respects, and lives with animals, they're already doing it. They're not calling it animal communication, but they're doing it. And I love this story. I, when, when I was in Minnesota and I go out to the bar and see Shiloh, and I go out about chore time in the evenings, um, and the guy that's um, 
managed the place. He would walk up and down an aisle of 40 horses, okay? It took him less than two minutes. And he was literally going, this horse needs that, this horse needs that, this horse needs that, this horse needs that. And it was phenomenal to watch him do that. And so I asked him one day, and you know, he just thought I was kind of crazy. He said, Russ, are, are, are there horses talking to you when you do that? And he goes, no, nah. he was an old cowboy kind of guy. He goes, no, they're not talking to me. I just worked horses all my life. I know horses. You know, those horses were talking to him. And, you know, Russ said they weren't, but I talked to the horses and I listened to what they told me and they go, yeah, we talked to him. He doesn't call it animal communication and he wouldn't because he thinks it's, he thought, how did he put it? Something like damn silly or damn stupid, something like that, you know, mumble, grumble, damn stupid animal communication kind of thing. He was a genius at it. And it was because it was so natural to him that he didn't realize that that was what he was doing. It was just what he did. So um, trust what the animals give to you and the information that they send to you. And trust that they, they've got your best good at heart, okay? So um, I would like to, um, a couple ways that we can stay connected um, after the call is first of all, uh, you're already on the mailing list because that's how you got this information. So you'll be seeing other calls that come up and other ways that we can stay in touch. And what I really want to um, invite you to do is this Thursday, I am so excited to be a guest on the Animal Spirit Teleseminar um, that's been going on for two weeks. This is the last week of it. And Shiloh and I will be there and we will be talking about totem animals, which is an animal who is our guide or our, our helper. I call them animal helpers. We will be talking about that. And it's a free um, workshop, free telesummit. And um, the, down, the downloads are free for 48 hours after each guest speaks. And there's been some incredible people on there speaking. So I will send you that information in the follow-up email that I sent tomorrow morning. And um, the other thing that I like to announce is that I'm going to be starting, and I hope to get this in June, I've been working on it. It's like I'm so close and yet so far away is to do workshops, monthly workshops about certain topics about uh, around animal communication. 90 minutes, it's going to be boom, from the comfort of your home. Um, boom, you can ask me the questions. There's no homework involved. You don't have to send me your notes <laughs> unless you want to kind of thing from that. <laughs> but it's going to be basic topics around animal communication. How do you talk to your dog? How do you talk to your horse? How do you talk to your cat? How do you know if they're hearing you? What are the common blocks for animal communication? And because I so fervently believe that animal communication is something we can all can do, and I want to keep it affordable for everybody, these 90-minute workshops are only going to be like $25 or $30, U.S. dollars. So they're really going to be um, very affordable, and there's going to be a wealth of information there, and there's going to be a wealth of like-minded people. Um, so I'm just loving that. And then the other thing is that if anybody wants to host their own animal communication class, then yes, yes, Jennifer, I saw that. <laughs> um, then yes, by all means, let's talk because the host just gets it for free, which includes four 90 minute classes. It includes um, the ebook, it includes the syllabus, it includes access to all of the recordings. It includes access to um, the, the Facebook group page. So there's a lot of things that the hostess gets. And the hostess basically does the liaison work between me and the students, which is gathering the people and then um, arranging a time. And then I have all the links, all the paperwork is set up. I send it to the host and the host sends it out. So if that's something you're interested in, um, you talk to me and, and we can work that out. Does anybody have any questions? I haven't checked the chat for a few minutes. Let me go back there. Oh, this is an excellent question. Do you feel the energy of an animal first before intuition comes through? I've never been asked that question. Let me think about that for a moment. I think when I first started, I did. I think that when I first started, that energy from the animal was like a, a conduit, like a doorway for me to walk through. Um, now when I do animal communication, because I do it so much and because I not only communicate with the, um, 
domesticated animals, but the animals in the wild and the angel animals. And because um, of walking the animistic shamanic path, um, now it's like I'm walking with a foot in both worlds. So, you know, sometimes it's Janet that's in the, the physical world. Sometimes it's Janet that's in the journey world, talking to Buffalo kind of thing. But I think um, if that is a way that helps you connect with the animals to feel that energy, and whether you're feeling it physically or whether you just have a sense that it's around you, however you experience it, to so go with that and use it as a pathway um, to connect with the animals. I, what, and I never thought of this until you asked that question is, um, all of the senses, you can think of each one of your senses as a pathway. So your eyes, connecting with your eyes. And I don't mean looking the dog in the face, okay? I mean energetically. You can have your eyes closed. Energetically, through your eyes, you're connecting with that dog. That's going to give you more of a focus, okay? More of like a, um, a, a, a straight point of being more like a laser line between you and the uh, animal kind of thing. So um, I want to thank everybody. First of all, any more questions? I don't want to. It's your time to stump the animal communicator. Go for it. Not questions about your animals. Those you can, um, you know, send me in the email. Um, any questions about the process or what animal communication is? You're welcome, Jan. Yes. Um, how how do you know? that what you're what you're getting in from them is not something that you know is being clogged or cluttered by something else that it that it is actually because when I, I sometimes I feel like I'm I'm in tune with them but then I'm worried am I letting something else that's cluttering my mind affect that excellent question so go back to the circle of quiet Jennifer okay that you're quieting yourself down Okay, mm -hmm. one of the tricks that you can do is when that monkey mind starts to go in, is I have an imaginary waste basket beside me, and I just take that monkey mind thought and I throw it in the basket, mm -hmm. kind of thing. And you know, when I think I'm quiet and then monkey mind crazy thought number 57 comes across, <laughs> I throw that mm -hmm. in the basket. And then after the session, if I wanna collect all my monkey mind again, I can, or I can throw it out. Living in Montana, what I love to do is open the window because believe it or not, they don't have screens here. Okay. So I open the window and it's like, there's the great outdoors. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I just literally throw that energy out and brother one takes it away. Um, but another thing about animal communication is when I first started, I thought it was like, yay, I'm talking to the animals. Yay, me, life is good. And then I realized that I was helping the animals and their people. And then I finally realized, yes, it's about the animals and their people, and it's about me. And it is not selfish to think animal communication is about you, because it is. Because we have to really know ourselves. We have to clear ourselves. We have to be a clear channel so that what we are getting is, um, is from the animal. And Jennifer, one of the words that you used is worried. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so you can ask yourself, what needs to be removed and not when you're communicating with the animals this is separate practice time away from the animals mm -hmm. what needs to be removed in me so that i am not worried okay okay and that could be anything that could be um you know I, sometimes we get that anxious feeling in our stomach or we've got so much to do that we just can't settle down it could be something like that it could be something um, carried forth from childhood and one thing that I have learned for myself personally, there's been a whole heck of a lot of stuff carried forth from my childhood that the animals are helping me release. And how does it get better than that? That the animals are helping me release it. And they are doing it by, um, particularly Shiloh, he's really good at calling me to the carpet and saying, uh-uh, this isn't going to work. You need to do A, B, C, D, and E. And with my angel horse Shiloh, that's pretty much the way he speaks to me. He's more gentle when he speaks to my students, except for the student that he stepped on her foot, which that's, <laughs> that was kind of funny. She, um, she kept saying that, oh, I can't do this. <sighs> you know, I, I probably could do this, but I just don't do it. And Shiloh was just going, well, I'll get her to do it. I'm going, you know, because I'm talking to this class um, virtually, and then I'm talking to Shiloh like over my shoulder. And it's like, oh, how are you going to do it? Well, step on her foot. No, Shiloh, 
You know, you know it is not polite to step on people's feet. You know that. Oh, I'll get her attention. I'll step on her foot. So it's, I'm like going, oh, geez, Louise kind of thing. And um, at the end of the exercise, when we were talking, I asked the student, and she told me what it was like. And she goes, you know, the funniest thing, my foot really started hurting about in the middle of the exercise. I just go, ah. Oh. And I couldn't help it. I started laughing. And then I felt really bad, you know, because you're not supposed to laugh at your, at your students. That's not good form. And but, so I told her, I said, well, here's why your foot is hurting. And I told her about Shiloh. And she's in one of the Dakotas, I think North Dakota. And she's familiar with horses. She goes, yeah, it kind of did feel like a horse was stepping on my foot. <laughs> so that's an energy kind of thing. And that's, um, that tells you how potent the relationship is between the animals and us if they can get us to feel a physical thing. So Jennifer, um, whatever, do you work with totem animals? I'm not familiar with that actually. Okay, all right, all right. Um, in that case, I highly encourage you to listen to um, the broadcast this Thursday, okay? We'll yeah. be talking the basics of it and what it is. Um, but you work with stones, essential oils, right? Yes. Okay. Um, do you feel comfortable listening to their message to you? Yes. Okay. All right. So whichever one, whether it's an oil and whichever oil it is, or whether it's a stone, whatever stone it is, ask for their help. Okay. Ask for them to help you know what, what is standing between you and communicating with the animals, what needs to be cleared. Okay. It probably will not be, oh, Jennifer, if you do A, B, C, D, and E, because after all, you're not talking to Shiloh. Okay. <laughs> um, and he wouldn't do that with you anyway. I don't know. He wouldn't. Um, it'll be a process. Okay. I don't expect it to happen overnight, but I think that you can look for a change and that things will start to happen differently. And it might be in that happen happening differently that drives you just absolutely crazy okay and then all of a sudden you realize whoa that that bit of craziness that's what needed to be released mm -hmm. yeah if you got any questions let me know or if you need any help with that because my intent for any time we're connected is not to leave you in the cold and say okay bye see you guys next week sign up for the newsletter sign up for my next class kind of thing that is not yeah that would be great if you do it that's cool but my intent is to support you on your journey through animal communication um, whatever that looks like for you any other questions and you're welcome yeah you're welcome All righty, I will let you folks go. Thank you for staying these few extra minutes. And uh, again, tomorrow I will be sending you the information. Remember to send me a picture of your notes, screenshot, whatever, and then a picture of your animal. And it could be alive or deceased, an angel animal or somebody you know, that you live with, um, their age, their name, and um, what your one question is, and I will get that out to you. I will also get you the recording, and I will also get you the... Um, information on the telesummit. So thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. I'll see you guys later. Take good care. Thank Sounds you, Jan. Mm -hmm. Thanks. You're welcome, Jennifer. Tell Jeff hello for me. I will. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.